Michelle. Welcome everyone to today's Ollie presentation of Tour of the Orchestra. I'm really pleased to welcome um, Philip Keltler. He is our associate uh, uh, principal cellist for the THSO. And today he's going to be talking a little bit about the Baroque cello and how that's different from the modern cello that you see uh, with the THSO every time you come to a concert. So um, Philip, I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away. Thanks, Sammy. Uh, hi, everybody. Thank you for having me. I'm sorry I can't be there in person, but I'm excited to be here with you on Zoom. Um, like Sammy said, my name is Philip. Uh, if any of you were watching these tour of the orchestra things last year, I also gave a presentation on cello uh, and how the cello might be seen in the orchestra as you guys see it with the THSO. But I'm here today, uh, today to talk about something very different, um, historical instruments the Baroque cello and also another instrument called the viola da gamba, um, which tell us a lot about how instruments and music developed from, you know, the medieval period, even from before the medieval period to, uh, to where it is today, how we've landed with our kind of standard instruments and um, kind of traditions that we have when we play. So uh, this is a lot of fun. I, I love playing these kinds of instruments and doing this type of music. So I'm very excited to be able to, to share it with you guys. Um, before I get to the instruments, which I have next to me, um, there's something really important I need to talk about. And it's something called temperament, which is related to how we tune. Tuning is very important. Um, obviously, when you have lots of people playing together, they need to be in tune. But our concept of what in tune is and what notes are um, have become standardized in our modern era. Um, we all kind of just agree that an A is an A, you know, a B is a B, everything is like that, and uh, that way a whole orchestra can play together in tune. But it's very important to remember, or to know rather, that uh, before the 20th century, uh, pitches were not standardized at all. And uh, I'll show you what I mean. So if you guys go to an orchestra concert, a Terre Haute Symphony Orchestra concert, you'll probably, the first thing you'll hear is the oboe tuning the orchestra with a note, and it's an A. So the oboe will play, excuse me, this note, and everybody will then tune their instrument so it matches that A, and that is our modern A. But I'm here to tell you that this note is also an A, and this note is also an A. Now, you might be thinking, excuse me, you know, what are you talking about, Philip? Those are three obviously different notes. Uh, and you're right, those are three obviously different notes, but they're all an A because depending on where we might have been at what time, uh, and we could have agreed that any of those uh, are an A because pitch before the modern era was completely relative and completely regional. Uh, so if we were in a place like Venice or Milan, we might hear an A that's really, really high, even higher than our modern A. And if we were in a place like Rome or Tuscany, we would hear an A that's really, really low, much lower than our modern A. But everybody in these areas agreed that these were the A, uh, and that's how we did it. So uh, I just wanted to, to put that out there, that I tuned my instruments to two different temperaments. Uh, so you, it might sound a little bit weird. It sounds very weird if you're not used to hearing these different temperaments, but I just wanted to explain that right away. Uh, and the reason it's really important to know that these instruments are tuned to different temperaments is because a different temperament can drastically affect the timbre of the instrument and therefore the quality of the music. So I'm going to give a quick example. I'm going to share my screen uh, really quickly and I'm going to hopefully also share my sound. Um, so we are here exploring the Baroque. So we talked about different temperaments, three different temperaments. There's a very famous piece for the cello that I'm sure many of you might know, the Bach Prelude to Cello Suite Number 1. 
Uh, and if we were going to hear this in a modern concert hall by a modern cellist, it would sound something like this. Yeah, that's our modern temperament. But if we had been alive in the 17th century and we had been in a place like Leipzig, it might have sounded more like this. And then if we went to somewhere like Rome, it would sound like this. So, those are, let's see, I'm going to stop sharing. Stop sharing. Those, that's the same music all played on a cello, all played on the same instrument, tuned to very, very different temperaments, giving it a very, very different character. Uh, I think it's really, really fascinating uh, and really special. And uh, something I'll be talking about a little bit later uh, is that kind of everything that we have today, all of our instruments, all of our temperaments, things like that have, have been, you know, like I said, very much standardized. But in the Renaissance and the Baroque and the medieval period, it was, it was much more like the Wild West and nothing was standardized. Um, so I think it's really exciting to, to learn about things like that. So now that I talked a little bit about temperament, I am going to show you guys the Baroque cello, which is the early predecessor to the modern cello that you see in an orchestra concert like at the Terre Haute Symphony. So, I'm gonna make sure I'm not blocking everything. Okay, can you guys still hear me okay? Everything good, Sammy? Yeah, I, I can hear you. Great. So, this I'm holding in my hands is a Baroque cello. Uh, which is a different instrument than my modern cello. But you might be wondering that it doesn't actually look that different. It actually looks quite similar. Um, and that's because it is. But first, I want to talk about the differences. Uh, the first very important difference uh, that you might not be able to see because of the video, but uh, this cello doesn't have an end pin. Modern cellos that we play, like in the orchestra, have a metal spike that come out of the, that comes out of the bottom that we attach to the ground, and that's how we play. That is a development of the 20th century to give cellists a little bit more stability. But before those were invented, cellists simply just had to rest their cellos on their legs, which is what I do when I play this cello. Um, so the lack of an end pin uh, is something that's very different about this cello, and might look kind of weird if you're watching a cellist play without this end pin. Um, the other important, another important difference, excuse me, is the material of the strings. Modern cellos now use strings that are made of metal, usually a combination of metals. Um, but before that, strings like the strings on this cello uh, were made of guts, usually from sheep, uh, unwound and strung together and put on an instrument. So these strings that I'm playing on on this cello, I, you can't really see it, I don't know, but these are unwound gut strings. You create a very, very different sound. Basically, they have much less tension than metal strings. Metal strings have a ton of tension on them so they can play very loud, can be very bright. And these gut strings are much less bright and create much less volume because they are made of something from a living animal rather than something that's uh, metal, you know. Uh, those are two very, very important differences. Um, the bridge and the tailpiece might also, uh, excuse me, the bridge and the sound post might also be different. Uh, another difference is that this tailpiece here is made of wood and doesn't have tuners on it. Modern cellists, you might usually see tuning with their tuners down here, 
broke uh, tailpieces don't have tuners, so we have to tune with our pegs up here. And on a modern cello, our tailpiece might be made of something like plastic or carbon fiber. Um, I think I showed you guys my plastic tailpiece on my modern cello last year. But um, basically, yeah, those are the those are the main differences. Other than that, you'll notice that this instrument is the same instrument as a modern cello. And that's because it is. Um, and when cellists today play on old cellos, they just modernize uh, the cellos to be able to play them uh, in a modern orchestra. So they'll put steel strings on it. They might put a new tailpiece on it that's made of something like plastic. They will add an end pin, that metal spike. Um, so yeah, if you guys were at the last Terre Haute Symphony concert that was a week or two ago when we played the Brahms double cello concerto, uh, our cello soloist, Natanya, has a really, really old cello. I think it was made in the 17 or 1800s. Which means that when it was built, it would have sounded like this. It would have had gut strings, no end pin, all of that stuff. And since then, it has been modernized so that she can play it in front of an orchestra uh, with metal strings and all of that stuff. So, uh, again, uh, things have sort of become standardized now, uh, but they were much less standard uh, back then. The other difference, uh, main difference between how we play this, between our modern instrument is the bow. I talked a little bit about the Baroque bow, I think, during my cello presentation last year. But modern bows are shaped like this, and Baroque bows are shaped like this. <clears throat> and there are two uh, kind of big things that that does. I mean, the first thing is that it doesn't give it a strong tip. It has a very weak tip. And it doesn't sustain the sound of the bow. So on a modern bow, we have a really strong tip and very evenly distributed weight across the bow. So we can draw a really kind of firm and sustained sound across the whole bow. And the tip is just as strong as the frog here. We call this part the frog. But on a broke bow, that is not the case at all. All the strength is here at the frog, and none of the strength is here at the tip. It's super, super weak tip. So our bow strokes decay, and our down bows, our bows that we do this way, are very strong, and our up bows, our bows that go this way, are very weak. It's very strong, weak, strong, weak. Um, you know, and that influences the way that we play when we play on a bow like this. We can't play a really, really long phrase that is sustained uh, or slurred many, many notes. Uh, it's just it's just not really possible with a bow like this. Um, so anyway, that's, that's sort of the quick spiel about the Baroque cello. Uh, and now I'm going to play you a little bit of Bach. And then afterwards, I will show you the other instrument that I brought, which is called the viola da gamba. So this is uh, a piece from the first Bach cello suite, the Sarabande. <laughs> thing to know about gut strings is that they don't stay in tune very well and it's a big pain but that's fine
So that's a little bit about the Baroque cello. And now, uh, get ready for a very, very, very different instrument. This instrument, which is called the viola da gamba. <laughs> to share my screen again and teach you guys a little bit about this really fascinating, <clears throat> really old and really weird instrument. So share screen, share sound. Good. So we're back to our PowerPoint. There we go. So, the viola da gamba. This is a great picture uh, of the viola da gamba of one of our viola da gamba icons, Christopher Simpson, the Englishman from the 17th century. Um, <clears throat> you notice a lot of differences between this instrument and the cello. This instrument is not at all a predecessor to the cello. It existed completely independently in its own family of instruments alongside the cello and alongside the violin family, um, but the viol family, um, totally different. So uh, yeah, in English, this instrument is called the viol, V-I-O-L. This is the bass viol because there are different sizes. Uh, in Italian, it's called the viola da gamba. And uh, it's not a fancy name. If any of you speak Italian, you'll know that gamba simply just means legs. So the name of this instrument is just the viola of the legs, on, on the legs. I don't know if it's of or on, but <clears throat> like the cello, the Baroque cello, which I'll show you when I back up again, we simply just rest this instrument on our legs when we play it. Um, so if you can see my instrument or you can see this picture, you'll notice a couple really, really stark differences. <clears throat> First of all, there are way more strings than are on a cello. A cello has four strings, and a gamba usually has six strings, like in this photo, or you can see mine, this one has seven. Uh, this is a specialized French version of the gamba that has a seventh, a low seventh string. It sounds a lot like a bass string. Um, but yeah, so first of all, we have many more strings. If you can see my, also the picture and my fingerboard up here, this instrument has frets, kind of like a guitar, but very different from a guitar in that the frets are not built in to the instrument, but rather they are made of gut like our strings and wrapped, just wrapped all the way around and tightened. And what that means is that we can move our frets and we can split them in half. Oh, this might be hard to see. Some of my frets, my frets are split in half like this one here. Um, so when we're playing things in different keys and different temperaments, like I was talking about, we need to move our frets to adjust the tuning. We can do that. Um, you might be thinking, wow, it sounds kind of nice to be able to play with frets. That must make intonation easier. It actually makes it much worse. Uh, so frets are a huge pain, but they're a big part of this instrument. Another thing, the holes on the gamba are not shaped like an F. So with violins and cellos, we call them F holes. We call these C holes because they are shaped like a C. Um, let's see, what else? Uh, oh, the shape of the instrument is very, very different. Um, the cello, if you'll remember, has these, sh the shoulders go straight out and down. It's much more rounded. Whereas these shoulders are sloped. So we have sloped shoulders. Uh, and the other most important thing about the building of the gamba that makes it sound way different than a cello is that the back of the gamba is flat. So violins and cellos have arched rounded backs, 
kind of like the front, the front and back are rounded. Uh, and that makes the instruments very powerful and strong. A flat back, like on a gamba, is much weaker. So a gamba, uh, because of the, uh, the flat back, uh, basically, uh, and the gut strings and all that, um, these instruments have a much more kind of subdued, introverted kind of sound, for example, than a violin or a cello which can be much louder, you know. So lots of differences here, um, and I'll, I'll talk more about that. But I want to show you uh, some iconography, some old paintings. Uh, so we think about violins and cellos being very old, which they are. But the violin didn't actually show up, uh, at least in writing, until about 1540 which is actually not super old when you think about the history of like Western art and Western art music. Uh, that's pretty actually late Renaissance. Um, that's when people started playing violins. Cellos came much later. Um, but we see some images here of what looked like they could be predecessors to the Gamba family. So if we look at these guys on the left in the, in the beautifully colored robes, we see, you know, these instruments are a very strange shape. We don't, we don't know really what they are, but we can kind of tell that they are playing them vertically on their laps, kind of. Um, and what's really important is that the bows that they are playing, they are holding underhanded with an underhanded bow grip. So when I play cello, when you see anybody play cello or violin, we hold the bow like this, overhand. That's how violinists play, that's how cellists play. Gamba, huge difference about playing the gamba is that you play the gamba with an underhanded bow grip like this, which is much, much older than the overhanded bow grip. So we see these guys holding their bows underhanded. Then if we look at this other picture from England, the 12th century, uh, now we have an instrument that looks a little bit more like a gamba or maybe even a violin with the way that it's shaped. But this man is holding his bow with an underhanded bow grip and he is resting the instrument on his leg. So um, this concept of instrument on the leg played underhand is way older than playing a violin, for example, on your shoulder with an overhanded bow grip. Um, I mean, that Spanish picture there from the 10th century is over a thousand years old. So uh, it's something that, that is, is much older, much more uh, ingrained. And so I talked a little bit about the Wild West before, and these instruments are really where that becomes apparent. So, I mean, already from this, these two pictures we're looking at, we're seeing some kind of weird things. Um, but before the Baroque period, the High Baroque period, when things started to become a little bit more standardized, like this gamba here, there were tons and tons of really, really wild instruments that are amazing. Uh, there's one called the Lira de Braccio, which you which you did play around your shoulder um, that had five strings, but two of them you didn't play because they rested underneath the bridge and they just resonated for extra sound. Um, the early violins, the VL and the Rebec, uh, might have had two strings or three or four or five and completely different shaped scrolls. Um, and then my favorite instrument, which you can see here on this video I'm about to show you, is called the Lerone, which has 14 strings and a flat bridge, which means that when you bow the Lerone, you're basically playing all of those strings at the same time. So you can't really play a melody, but what you can do is play beautiful, beautiful harmonies on one instrument by itself. I mean, it, it sounds uh, really wonderful. So I'm gonna show you uh, this video, which features three very early Renaissance, possibly medieval uh, instruments, just to show you what these instruments looked like and sounded like before, way before people were playing violins and things like that. So this first instrument is the Lerone. Like, and just really quickly, that to me sounds like it could be an entire string quartet playing together. But in fact, that's just, it's just one instrument.
Yeah, so that's just a really short clip of three really wonderful, uh, strange sounding instruments. Uh, looking at this instrument over here to the left, uh, that is an, kind of an early ancestor of this gamba that I'm holding, but you can see the very strange shape of these upper shoulders here. Um, the tiny treble gamba that this, this man on the right is playing, um, we can see, yeah, has, has a much different shape. These smooth edges here. Uh, anyway, yeah, these, these, the instruments, there were so many different kinds of instruments at this time, uh, but they sounded really lovely. So uh, I just wanted to show that to you guys. Oops, excuse me. So eventually the viol family, the gamba family, did start to become a little bit more standardized. And there is a, you know, what we think of a standard viol family. So like the violin family that has instruments in different sizes, you know, the violin family has the violin, the viola, the cello, and the double bass. Uh, the gamba family is just like that too. There's a treble viol, which is about the same size as a violin. There's a tenor, which is a little bit larger than a viola, but kind of in that same category, I guess, and, and timbre. And then the bass viol is roughly the same size as a cello. And then there's also an instrument called the violone, which is the same size as a, ba a double bass that you might see in an orchestra. The main difference, though, between this whole family is that with the violin family, there are very different techniques to play the instrument. So violins and violas, musicians will play up on their shoulder, and then cellos and basses, we play vertically down on the ground, like this. Um, and those techniques are, are very different. A cello player like myself cannot pick up a violin and play it. Um, I mean, maybe a little bit, but the technique is so different that, that they certainly wouldn't be able to play it. But a vi in the viol family, all those different instruments are all played vertically resting upon the legs. So whether or not you are playing the treble, which is very small, like, like this man here, or the bass, like me that I'm holding right now, uh, the technique is all the same. It just gets smaller and bigger. So I have a video that I will hopefully be able to show you guys here. Uh, this is kind of a standard vial consort, uh, which is the word just meaning kind of ensemble. Uh, vial consorts were extremely popular during the Renaissance and broke periods. Um, and you can see here in this picture, these are the three kind of primary sizes. So all the way on the left here is the treble, which is about the same size as a violin, but you play it on your legs. This here is the tenor, second from the left. And then these two on the right are both basses, the same size as the one that I'm holding. Um, so it kind of, you might think it, it could be an earlier version of something like a string quartet, which has four instruments, and you're right, it kind of is. Um, but consorts could be all kinds of things. They could be four people, they could be three people, five. Uh, they could be just vials, or they can also have lutes, or organs, or wind instruments. Um, there's a lot, a lot of great stuff. But it's, it's, it's important to know that these vial consorts like this were extremely popular, especially uh, in royal settings, like in courts. Um, kings and princes and people like that loved and basically had you, you have to have a vile consort in your palace you know if you want to be legit that kind of thing um and uh one of my favorite quotes by christopher simpson that man that i showed you before uh is that a vial in the hands of an excellent violist may no doubt be reckoned amongst the best musical instruments so uh these are very very popular and now I'm going to play a little bit of this video to kind of show you what a vial consort sounds like.
hard to find a place to stop. But that is uh, an example of a viol consort. Uh, to me, what is so astounding about the sound of viols playing together is that the blend of viols playing together is is absolutely amazing. Um, I talked a little bit about the construction of the instrument, these sloped shoulders and the flat back give it a little bit more of a, a subdued sound. And I think that that allows them to blend together so wonderfully. I mean, string instruments like violins and cellos can also blend together very well. Uh, but I think gambas do it uh, especially well, it, much better than violins and cellos. Um, and there are times when I close my eyes listening to something like that and it almost just sounds like an organ, you know, one instrument playing these parts that kind of like come in and out of each other. Um, so getting to play in and hear viol consort music uh, is, is, is wonderfully special. Uh, and I wish there were more opportunities to do it. But uh, yes, so that uh, is kind of a little bit about the history of uh, gambas uh, and where they came up. And now I'm going to show you guys a little bit more about how we play the instrument. I'll play a little bit more. And then I, I will hopefully be able to save some time at the end for things like questions uh, and things like that. So, uh, first thing, oops, sorry. Uh, we don't need that yet. I am going to stop sharing. Okay. So, I briefly mentioned a very important thing that looks very strange. That when we play the gamba, we play it with an underhanded bow grip. Um, the first time I saw somebody playing with an underhanded bow grip, I thought it was insane. I was like, why would anybody do that? Uh, it seems a little bit more natural that we might just hold the bow like this, overhanded, and just put our weight into the string like we do when we play cello and violin. But there are reasons that the bow was developed, or sorry, this bow grip was developed this way. Uh, in fact, like I told you guys much earlier than the overhanded bow grip. Um, and there are two kind of main reasons. Uh, when we bow, and I'll back up again for one second. When I'm playing Baroque cello and when a violinist is playing violin, and we're holding our bow like this. I showed you guys a little bit before that our strong bow goes this way to our right, and our weak bow comes this way. We call this down bow and up bow. Strong, weak. And on gambo, now when we're holding the bow from the other direction, it is the opposite. So our bow direction going this way is the strong one, and then it's weak going this way. It's very opposite. Uh, and it might seem a little counterintuitive because obviously our strength lies with our hand. Why would our strength not be here? Why is it here? Well, there are two reasons. Uh, first, the gamba essentially is very similar to the lute, uh, which is an instrument that you play strummed on its side. A um, lot of similarities between the gamba and the lute, and basically, if you think about it very, very simply, a gamba is a lute with a curved bridge that you can play with a bow. But because the gamba has so many strings and the strings are tuned closer together than on a cello, uh, you can do things like play chords, and chordal passages like I did when I demonstrated it first, uh, much better than you can do on something like the cello, you know? You could do that with your bow, or you could do it like you would do it on a lute. So, if I was playing lute, or guitar, for example, if any of you guys play guitar, you'll know that our strong strum is down, and our weaker strum is up. So, if we take this same concept and just make it vertical, this way is down. This direction is our strong direction, and this direction is our up direction. Is our excuse me, is our weak direction. So if we then just translate that to a bow, we're going this way. This is our strong strum, and this is our weak strum. So that is one reason 
why when you're holding an underhanded bow, this is stronger than this. The other reason, and this is something I do, if, if we were in person, I might, you know, call somebody to demonstrate, but maybe you can do it with yourself or someone next to you. I don't know. But if you went up to somebody to shake their hand and you were pressing your hands together and you were pressing really hard, the direction of our strength is this way. If I'm pushing on something, I'm going to push it like this. Our direction going this way, our strength is much weaker. I'm not going to push something, you know, like this from the outside. That is much weaker than pushing it forward like this. So this is weak. This is strong. So again, that relates to our bow direction here. Going this way, this is strong. This is how we push. We push this way, and this is much weaker. So uh, that is why bowing is basically the opposite as it is on cello. Once we start holding our bow overhand and we're playing something like violin, then everything gets gets thrown out the window. Uh, but I think these these are why the this bow grip was was originated. Uh, because this way is stronger than this way. Uh, so if you ever see gambas playing and you realize that everything looks backwards from what you're used to seeing on a cello, well, it, it kind of uh, it kind of is. Uh, so now the last thing I'm going to show you guys, and I'm going to share my screen one more time, is music that the gamba plays. Again, everything now, musical notation is very standardized you know, notes on the page, if, you, if you've seen written sheet music, uh, it all roughly looks the same, <clears throat> except for maybe some like crazy modern notation. But again, before that notation was standardized, there were older forms of notation that also certain ones that related specifically to the gamba that were really, really great. And I just want to briefly show you some of them, what they look like, uh, to know what a gamba player or anybody playing in the 16th or 17th century, might have had to read. They couldn't just sit down and read music. They had to read something like this. So the first one is something called uh, tablature. So again, if there, if any of you guys play guitar, you've probably played from tab, uh, which is it's it's not notated sheet music. It just tells you which fret to play. That is exactly what this is. Uh, that is not a new invention. Tablature dates back to at least the 15th century. Um, and that's what this is here. So if we look, we have letters, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, you know, etc. And basically it shows you what string to play on. And then if you see an A, that means you play an open string. Uh, if you see a B, that means you play on the first fret. C, uh, C is the second fret, D, etc. So what that means, is that, if I can change my slide here, <clears throat> all of a sudden you don't really know, you don't really need to know how to read notes as long as you can read tablature and your instrument is in tune. You can play all kinds of music. This is an example of a tab setup uh, for all different types of tunings. So uh, it would be really hard for a modern player to change the tuning of their instrument and play music because we know where our notes are. And if we see a D written on the page, we know where it is. And so if our string was tuned to a different note, it would be really hard to find that D. But this that I'm sharing with you right now uh, shows us that if you can read tab, tablature, it doesn't matter what, uh, you know, what the notes are. As long as you know what fret to play, your instrument could be tuned to anything and you could still play the music. So composers, this is a chart um, in the Manchester Gamba book Composers used all different kinds of wacky tunings uh, to create different timbres and sounds, uh, but then they just wrote the music in tab so any player that could play tab uh, could play it. And it was really great. So I would like to show you guys an example of tab. This is a piece called A Jig by Tobias Hume from his book called Musical Humors. And this is tab. So as you can see on the very top of the lines above the letters, there are musical notes. And that tells us what rhythm to play. So for example, that first note, I play an eighth note, and all the notes after that I play as eighth notes until I get a new rhythm, and then I play all of the following notes like that. So here in this first measure, I have four eighth notes, 
then it switches to quarter notes, so then I have two quarter notes and two half notes. That is very simply how we read tabs. So looking at this, this doesn't really look like music, but it sounds like this. That's that first line of, of this jig by Tobias Hume, uh, written in tab. So, uh, yeah, in addition to being able to play from regular notated music, uh, musicians back in this era also had to be able to read tab. Gamma players had to be able to read tab. And there's lots of amazing music uh, written in tab. Mostly English music. The English people especially love tab, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, another thing. The French had their own thing going on too. So the English had tab. And the French had, had, had an, an entire language of, of uh, instructions that they gave. Little things in the music on top of musical notation. So this first one, for example, a tremblement, uh, which just looks like a little apostrophe. Um, that is a, a, you know, a shake, a trill. A battement, that second one, the X, a, a simple mordant. Um, you know, we have slow, towards the bottom, the plant is a very slow, wide kind of vibrato that you specifically do with your fourth finger and your fourth finger only. Uh, the very last one, that, that little italic E called an enflé, that's a big swell. So, uh... Now, these, these are the kinds of things that French composers, for example, liked to put all over their music to give us instructions of what to do. This is a piece by uh, Marin Marais, who's one of the most important gamba composers. But you'll notice if we look at this music, uh, that first note has that little E over it, an enflé. The one, two, three, fourth note has that vertical squiggly line on it. We have, in the beginning of the second measure, that X, that mordant. Uh, there are tons of instructions in music like this. Uh, it's, it's not even that dissimilar to when we play modern music uh, and we see an instruction on every single note. We think, oh my God, you know, why did the composer do this? Uh, composers in the 16th and 17th century were doing things like that too. Um, and uh, it's really, really wonderful. I will play just also the first line of this one and hopefully be able to play some of these uh, these things. So that's just a quick example of uh, what people in France were doing. People in England were doing very different things. People in Italy were doing very different things. Uh, again, uh, there was not any kind of standardized system, really. Music looked a lot different, and it sounded a lot different, but it allowed composers uh, to write in very, very specific languages, uh, specific for themselves, and it, it, the music is really beautiful. Uh, if we have a little bit of time at the end, I, I'll, I'll play a recording of some more French music for you all because the French Baroque music is my favorite. Um, but yeah, I, I thought it was important for you guys to see what some of this weird music might look like. Uh, and I, I will open it up to questions really quickly in a minute. Um, but really first, I just wanted to uh, mention that... Uh, well, I guess address the question that I get sometimes. Uh, not not all players like to play these historical instruments. And a question I get even from my colleagues all the time is, you know, why do you do that? Uh, what's the point? You know, I have my modern cello and there's lots of like beautiful music. I can play Bach on my modern cello. Um, and that's certainly true. Uh, you can play music written in this time on modern instruments. Uh, that's fine. But I think that understanding the way that these instruments uh, were built 
the way that they sound, the way that you have to play them, you know, playing gut strings is very different than playing metal strings, uh, tells us a lot about the music. You know, composers write music for the times and the resources that they have. Um, <clears throat> so the violin that Bach was writing his Bach violin partitas for is way different than the violin that uh, you might see in the Terre Haute Symphony on stage today. Uh, and therefore he wrote his music to be played on an instrument like that. Uh, and I think that can tell us a lot about uh, how we play that. Even if I play a Bach cello suite on my modern cello, I can approach it from a perspective of understanding how the Baroque cello uh, works and how it feels. Um, so I think it's really important to understand these instruments. I also think that they're absolutely gorgeous. Uh, they create such a different sound that you can't really replicate on a modern instrument. Um, so. Anyway, that's my little sales pitch of why these instruments are great and why this music is great. But uh, we have a little bit of time. I would love to hear uh, questions or anything like that about the gamba, about the Baroque cello, about uh, music, about anything. So, yeah, ask away. Great. Thank you. Michelle, I have a question if no one in your group has a question yet. Go ahead and ask your question. Okay, Philip, I was wondering, so some of the videos that you were showing us, were those musicians playing replicas of the instruments or how many of these early instruments have we actually found from that time period and how many are actually replicas? So that is a great question. In the violin family, violins, violas, cellos, we have many more um, historically preserved instruments for two reasons. One, they are built... Uh, more sturdy, more sturdily, if that's a word. Um, so I mentioned uh, these flat backs. These flat backs are very structurally uh, weak compared to, compared to an arched back that a violin has. So old gambas, all the time, you see many cracks on the backs of old gambas. Also, this is not something you will be able to see on this video, but gambas, the wood is much thinner. Um, the wood... I mean, obviously these instruments are hollow, but the wood on a gamba is so thin. That also contributes, I think, to its like very beautiful introverted sound. Cello, the wood in a cello, which is also hollow, is much thicker. It's just more strongly built. Uh, so that's the main reason that we have many more uh, old violins and cellos than we do old gambas. The other reason, this is something I should have mentioned. Uh, I'm sure for some of you, you've, you've never seen a gamba before, and there's a reason for that. Um, basically, I, I, I mentioned that these two instrument families existed alongside each other for many years. Uh, and then the gamba family kind of went away and the violin family took the stage. And, and the main reason is that these instruments, gambas, in addition to being used for sacred music uh, in churches and things like that, their main place, uh, like I mentioned before, was in courts was in royal settings. Um, and then violins and cellos, the violin family, their main place uh, was in the concert hall, the public concert hall. Uh, and, you know, you all know that public concert halls still exist and courts and palaces don't really anymore. When, when courts and palaces and things like that started to go away, so did the popularity of these instruments. So... Another reason we don't have as many historically preserved gambas is because there was a really long period when people stopped caring for them. People never stopped playing cellos and violins um, and preserving them and keeping their hands on these old ones. And so many of these gambas uh, from the 16th and 17th century have been lost uh, or completely neglected and, and are totally ruined, um, which is very sad. So. Often, it's much more common, if you're seeing a gamba concert, most likely the gamba players are going to be playing on modern replicas. And if you see a concert of violins and cellos, uh, people, it is totally possible that people are playing on old, beautiful uh, historical instruments. Even, like I said, like we saw at the Tarot Symphony last week. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, it's a good, it's a good question. Yeah. So is yours um, owned by IU, and I assume it's a modern replica? Yes, this this uh, gamba was made in 1977 in Vermont, um, and it's very very beautiful by by a great maker. I'm very lucky to 
to play this. Uh, but yeah, like Sammy said, this one is owned by IU, uh, and hopefully I will own one one day. But yeah, certainly a, a modern modern replica. Are they pretty expensive nowadays? To I mean, do they have to be specially made or? Well, that's another thing, and I guess it's a good thing for us um, because gambas are not as popular as violins. They are uh, not into... as expensive. Yeah, uh, and so. They are a little bit harder to find because fewer makers make them, but uh, a professional level gamba next to a professional level cello will be much more affordable. I mean, they're still expensive. Um, you still might end up paying around ten thousand dollars, but that compared to a, a a cello, like a professional level cello, is incredibly uh, affordable. So, yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. Cool, Michelle. Are there any questions on your side? Yeah, give me a second. Okay, here, David. Hi, this is David. Can you hear me? Yeah, yes. I can hear you fine. Okay. <laughs> uh, when you were playing uh, the the changing from the cello back over to the gamba, underhanded, overhanded, how difficult was that to do when you first started? Uh, it was incredibly difficult to do, and it still is. Um, you know, I, I didn't mention much else about the tuning and things like left hand technique um but the underhanded bowing is very very strange um the other really strange thing that's difficult for a cellist when they're learning how to play gamba is that when we play cello and we're using our overhanded bow grip and we extend outward we extend with our elbow so i lift up my elbow like that when you're playing gamba underhanded you want your weight to always be down. So you're pulling your weight down into the instrument. So what that means is that as you extend your arm, you don't extend your elbow. Your elbow always stays in. I'm trying to keep my elbow as close to my body as I can. So most cellists, if they're trying to play gamba, the first thing they do is like shoot their elbow out. Um, so I, I mean, there, I had years of my teacher getting on me to not do that with my elbow. That was a tough one. The other tough thing that's different uh, is the way the strings are tuned. Cellos are tuned in perfect fifths, so are violins. So uh, you have a C, a G, a D, and an A. Gambas are tuned in fourths and uh, thirds. That is a major third. That's a, These are fourths, these are fourths. That's a major third. And then fourths, fourths, fourths. So that is really uh, confusing. If you, Even if something as simple as playing a scale, now all of our notes are in a different place. Um, oh, wow. That took a lot of getting used to. The other thing, again, is these seven strings. Now everything is on a different plane. So uh, I'm used to cello. I don't have to look at the instrument. I know that if I'm on my A string and I want to play my G string, I just, that's two strings away. I can just feel that. But now if I, if I move that same distance on gamba, I, I'm not crossing two strings. I'm crossing like five strings. Uh, and all of a sudden hitting the right string, if you're going, you know, down and up is way harder. There's just like, you know, there are many more variables, many more strings. So uh, that is a good question. Uh, switching between them is quite difficult. But gamba players these days are pretty much always also cello players. It's people that started by playing cello and then found their way into gamba as well. So uh, thankfully we have our bass with our cello and then and then we kind of find our way into gamba technique eventually it's, it really is a completely different instrument I mean, it's <laughs> yeah hey, do you have a question nope david do you have any more uh, yes i do have another one um when you are playing the, the your older instrument like this are you in a, do you have a quartet or anything that you're participating in to actually use it a lot? Yes. Uh, so I'm very fortunate to uh, to play in a viol in a consort uh, here at IU. There is an ensemble called Concentis, and it's it's wonderful because it is a uh, it kind of serves as a viol consort and a mixed consort. So. About half of the music I play with Concentis is a group of just viols, four or five. And then the other half is music that we play with different instruments. So lutes, theorbos, uh, voices, organ, 
Uh, sometimes we have wind instruments like cornetto and block flute and things like that. So that music, all we play in that group is music from the Renaissance. Um, so uh, it basically almost never involves violins or cellos because it's older than that. Uh, but sometimes it might. Um, but yes, thankfully, I, I am very fortunate to uh, play in that large ensemble. And then I play solo repertoire and chamber music repertoire uh, with my colleagues and friends, um, like, you know, a gamba and a lute and a harpsichord is like the perfect trio, you know, so, uh, or two gambas, two gambas and a lute or two gambas and a theorbo. So, uh, thankfully I do, I do get to play with people, but in the, out in the world, it's, it's, it can be difficult to find people that play these instruments. By any chance, do you have a program, uh, schedule? To play yes, for the absolutely. public? Yes, uh, absolutely. We have a concert in December, uh, and I am happy to share that with Sammy or anybody. And I was going to say, if you'll send me like a link to your, the group's website, I will share that with Michelle, and she can send that out. Um, and then if you would also send me the links to all the videos that you shared so that they could go watch the videos in whole if they'd like to, um, I'd be happy to do that. that thank you, David. <laughs> I think that's a great idea. And, and I have to tell you that I was actually listening to the music, but I wasn't watching, watching, because I actually have to teach in like 30 minutes myself. So I was double dutying it today. But you still put me in the right mood because I am literally teaching about Prague. And so I'm basically doing like a tourist ver version of Prague and I'm going through concert halls and old cathedrals and the music was just perfect for it. Yes, absolutely. In a cathedral, yeah, this kind of music in like an old cathedral is. Yeah, I mean, I, I just kept reading about, you know, the, the basilica or this cathedral or this chapel or, you know, the astronomical clock in the center of Prague. And I just was listening to the music at the same time. And I'm like, okay, yeah, I'm, 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 I'm in that place right now. I'm good. Maybe, maybe we can somehow put, put some kind of Baroque music series together with all the churches in Terre Haute. Cause there's, oh my gosh. Yeah. Oh. Oh, that would that. be so cool. And there are tons of musicians that would love to play. That's a great okay. idea, Sammy. We'll chat, Philip, because that would be really cool to do. <laughs> yeah, I, I think that's a fantastic idea. And then, you know, let me know, and I will see if I can come up with maybe someone who can just kind of, you know, do, especially if we do it's kind of church-centered. We might be able, specifically time period-wise, like Steve Stoffern on campus, like his, um, his special area, I think medieval history so he could kind of like do maybe a teeny tiny little presentation perfect. historically wise that's perfect we'll chat more this that would be a very cool idea that would be awesome all right any other questions 